Welcome back to Plug Life Television and a special welcome for the large influx of new subscribers off the back of the video interview that Nick of EV Nick Fame and I did at Fully Charged Live where we discussed C rates and rapid charging and just how fast you can charge an EV battery. That video, I've given you the link down in the description below, um, has already gathered quite a lot of positive feedback and it's great to see so many people interested in the sort of techie side of batteries and EVs and uh, coming to Plug Life Television to find out more, so welcome aboard. Uh, back to today's topic, uh, we're going to be covering the second part of the Plug Life Manifesto on rail travel and during this we're going to be looking at longer distances, we're going to be looking at higher speed rail routes, how can we decarbonize those without using overhead lines and in the process we're going to be pitching batteries and fuel cells, we're going to be looking at the benefits and demerits of both. Um, so let's see which one comes out best. In the first part of the Plug Life Manifesto on rail travel, we looked at how common sense and power dense energy storage technologies could easily electrify some of Scotland's busiest routes. Now let's have a look at short regional services without overhead lines. Scotland has numerous short routes that are under 40 miles in length and have no electrification, including Glasgow to Kilmarnock and the newly built Borders Line. Despite the popularity of some of these routes, the cost of their electrification is prohibitive. The solution here is battery-powered trains. Not using some revolutionary new chemistry from the lab, but off-the-shelf commercial lithium-ion cells. Multiple examples of this already exist. Network Rail's Batteries Included project, which was a converted electric multiple unit, used conventional lithium-ion cells. The project aimed to achieve a range of 15 miles per charge, but ended up achieving 50 miles at speeds of up to 100 miles per hour, complete with passenger mod cons such as air conditioning. It recharged its battery off of overhead lines and could run conventionally on those wires, but sadly has since been reverted to its original specification. Viva Rail's battery electric train is converted London Underground stock that has been repurposed for use on branch lines. Their train uses second life lithium-ion cells and can achieve a range of 60 miles per charge. Viva Rail recently unveiled a new fast charger for this train, which consists of short third and fourth rails installed at stations, and which only go live when a train is on top of them. Therefore, battery electric rail travel is already feasible for many routes. Furthermore, advances in cell chemistry will improve range, and advances in battery management will improve the lifespan of battery packs. I'll cover these in more detail later. Interestingly, the power-dense but not energy-dense lithium iron phosphate cathode and lithium titanate anode mentioned last time are also suitable for this application, due to their proven reliability in electric buses, long service lives and good safety record. They will also allow regenerative braking to be maximised since they can rapid charge quickly. Another option is sodium ion cells. Unlike lithium, sodium ions are too large to fit in between the sheets of graphene that comprise a graphite anode, so a hard carbon anode is used instead. Advantages of sodium ion include reduced costs associated with materials used and improved safety since the cells can be reversibly discharged to zero volts, which is advantageous when conducting maintenance work on high voltage equipment. Whilst these cells are still under development, progress is being made by a company called AGM in Thurso. Renault are interested in the project. Sodium ion cells should be on the market between 2025 and 2030 and will not only reduce the cost of battery powered rolling stock, but potentially make the construction of new branch lines and reopening of old ones economically feasible. So the battery electrification of shorter rail services is entirely feasible, and set to become even more appealing with upcoming cell chemistries. Now let's have a look at longer and high speed routes which don't have electrified lines. Several strategically important routes in Scotland fall into this category, including the Glasgow Southwestern Line, which is used if there's a problem on the West Coast Main Line, the Aberdeen to Inverness Line, services to the ferry terminals for the Western Isles, and the Far North Line. Many of these routes don't have a high volume of traffic, so they are not economical to electrify using overhead lines. However, they are vital for the communities that they serve. One possible solution here is fuel cell trains. Alstom have led the way in this sector with the Coradia iLint, which is a hydrogen fuel cell powered version of the Coradia Lint series. It has a range of up to 500 miles per tank of hydrogen and a top speed of 87 miles per hour. Recently, Alstom have unveiled the Breeze for the UK market. This is a converted Class 321 electric multiple unit. Details of range and top speed are unknown, but it is likely safe to assume that they are broadly similar to the island. The train has increased passenger capacity versus the diesel trains that they are designed to replace, but reduced passenger capacity versus their original specification as a Class 321. Generally speaking, the source to wheel efficiency of a fuel cell train is less than one that is powered by a battery. The fuel cell itself 
tends to have a best case efficiency of about 60%, but low-grade waste heat from the fuel cell could potentially be captured and used as cabin heating in colder weather. An alternative to hydrogen for fuel cells is ammonia. Most existing ammonia production techniques are carbon intensive, but ammonia can be produced using renewable energy, water and nitrogen from the air. Furthermore, running ammonia through a fuel cell does not produce CO2 or NOx emissions. Whilst more energy is required to produce ammonia than hydrogen, far less is required to freeze and pressurise it to liquefy it for storage, since ammonia liquefies at minus 33 degrees C at atmospheric pressure, whilst hydrogen liquefies at minus 253 degrees, unless very high pressure is applied to the gas. Additionally, liquid ammonia has double the volumetric energy density of liquid hydrogen, meaning that a fuel cell train could run twice as far on one tank of ammonia than on one tank of hydrogen. However, despite being commonly used as a fertiliser, ammonia is corrosive, toxic and hazardous to aquatic systems, and liquid ammonia is hygroscopic, that is, it attracts water, and can damage human tissue if handled improperly. These considerations should be factored into any ammonia-based rail infrastructure, and necessary precautions put in place. Returning to hydrogen, the production of hydrogen is another important consideration. On-site hydrogen production at train depots and stations is an attractive proposition. Scotland's grid is one of the cleanest in the world. Scotland now meets 70% of its electricity demands with renewables, of which wind makes up the majority. The rest of the demand is met with nuclear and gas. This results in a very low carbon footprint for hydrogen production. By removing the need to transport hydrogen to where it will be consumed, the source-to-wheel efficiency of the fuel cell train is improved. The carbon footprint is further improved by utilising excess renewables, rather than adding to grid demand at peak times. However, there's something else that we can do with the excess renewables. Store it in batteries. Grid storage batteries can be built at train depots and railway termini. These batteries would be recharged using excess renewables from the grid and or on-site renewables. The large grid storage battery could then dump hundreds of kilowatts of power into a rapid charging train without putting stress on a weak remote grid, or a grid that is undergoing peak demand in the evening. Furthermore, the grid storage battery could also provide grid balancing in remote communities with weaker grids, providing an additional source of revenue for the operator and maximising the efficiency of electricity use. The operator could potentially be the same company that manufactured the trains in the first place, giving them a healthy additional revenue stream. Comparing the source-to-wheel efficiency of on-site hydrogen production and fuel cell trains to on-site electricity production and battery trains, we see that the fuel cell option is approximately 34% efficient. Conversely, even if we leave in the option of charging the grid storage battery from grid electricity and factor in the battery-to-battery -battery charging efficiency losses, we find that the battery electric train is 58% efficient, thus yielding 70% more usable energy than hydrogen for the same electrical input and increasing the profit margin for the grid storage battery operator accordingly. But can batteries go the distance in cross-country trains? When it comes to energy density requirements for the rail sector, battery technology is catching up with fuel cells. One of the most promising new cell chemistries is solid-state lithium, which replaces the liquid electrolyte and polymer separator of conventional lithium-ion cells with a solid electrolyte, and the graphite anode with pure lithium foil, yielding a 2-3-fold to three -fold increase in energy density and surpassing 400 watt-hours per kilogram. During charging, the solid electrolyte encourages lithium ions to coat uniformly onto the lithium foil rather than form branch-like growths called dendrites, which can cause internal short circuits, thus making this cell chemistry resistant to dendrites. In fact, solid-state lithium cells are tipped to tick all of the boxes when it comes to energy storage, with high energy density, dendrite-resistant operation, reduced cost, a large operating temperature window, rapid charging and long cycle lives. Solid-state lithium cells are being intensively researched and developed by numerous academic and industrial groups across the globe, including Dyson and Toyota, and are expected to become widely commercially available between 2022 and 2030. Automotive scale cells will be of interest for long distance and high speed battery electric rolling stock. Lithium sulfur cells work by bonding lithium to chains of sulfur called polysulfides, ultimately leaving two lithium ions bonded to one sulfur atom when the cell is fully discharged. Lithium sulfur cells have a high gravimetric energy density, that's per kilogram rather than per litre, and a high pressure tolerance, which makes them attractive to the aerospace industry. Lithium sulfur cells aren't expected to be commercially available until 2025 to 2030, but Oxus Energy are producing automotive scale prototypes and building a production line in Brazil. Given the light weight of these cells, they're well suited to battery electric rolling stock being used on weight restricted routes such as the Far North Line. Also look out for hybrids of the aforementioned cells, such as solid state sodium, 
which would combine high energy density with low cost and abundant materials to provide a superior option to today's lithium ion cells. And also sodium sulfur cells, which would have the additional bonus of even more abundant and lightweight cathode materials combined with a comparatively low price. The batteries of the near future will be more energy dense, more power dense, lighter, longer lasting and safer. Increased efficiency versus fuel cells could lead to considerable cost savings for the train operating company. A further important consideration is the future proofing of new rolling stock. This new rolling stock will have a lifespan of several decades and thus likely outlast at least one battery pack in the process, but the new and improved batteries of tomorrow will not be the same as the batteries of today. Will today's rolling stock be compatible with them? Imagine that a revolutionary new cell chemistry comes along that has a higher capacity but lower cell voltage. This would require additional series steps in the battery pack to meet the system voltage of the application. However, with a conventional BMS, this isn't possible since the number of cells in series would then become greater than the number of voltage inputs on the vehicle's BMS. Once the pack is connected up, the original number of steps can connect to the BMS fine, but the additional steps cables have nowhere to go. This means that their voltage cannot be monitored, which is a safety risk. If another revolutionary cell chemistry came along with a higher cell voltage than the original cells in the pack, the pack would require less series steps. This time, there will be more BMS voltage inputs than series steps. So once the pack is connected up, the BMS will notice the absence of some of the voltage inputs, throw an error message and refuse to power up the system. The Cozy have resolved this issue completely with its cell intelligence system, in which a wireless chip is embedded in every cell in the pack, relaying everything including voltage, temperature, state of health and the cell's history back to the BMS masterboard via a near-field RF antenna. Not only is the Decozy system chemistry agnostic, but it can easily adapt to a new system voltage or series parallel configuration. A quick over-the-air software update to the interface unit tells the Decozy system all it needs to know about the new battery pack, how many cells are in series and parallel, and what their maximum and minimum voltages are. As such, rolling stock could be fitted with new batteries using any cell chemistry until the chassis rusted through. Therefore, with a combination of fuel cells initially, then next generation batteries and next generation battery management systems, even long and high speed railway lines can be decarbonised without using overhead lines. With all of this in mind, the Plug Life Manifesto on rail travel is as follows. The use of diesel stock on the east and west coast main lines originating from south of the border and serving Scottish stations that are entirely on electrified routes is banned with immediate effect. The purchase of new diesel rolling stock for Scotland's railway routes is banned with immediate effect. The transfer of diesel rolling stock from elsewhere in the UK or the rest of the world to the ScotRail fleet will be banned by 2025. The East Coast Main Line and Fife Circle north of Edinburgh shall be fully electrified using a conventional overhead line, with the exception of low bridges and tunnels and the fourth rail bridge. Rolling stock with pantographs and onboard batteries or supercapacitors with sufficient capacity to propel the rolling stock between electrified sections of line shall be ordered immediately to run on these routes, with a minimum of four cars per service. Charging solutions shall be installed at key stations on the borders, Glasgow to Kilmarnock, Dumfries to Carlisle and Wick to Thurzo lines to allow the use of battery electric rolling stock. Hydrogen or ammonia fuel cell rolling stock shall be ordered for all longer and high speed routes that cannot yet be served by battery powered rolling stock, including the Far North Line, Inverness to Kyle of Lochalsh, Aberdeen to Inverness and Glasgow South Western Line. In order to maximise the efficiency of our national energy consumption, fuel cell traction shall be phased out when improvements in technology allow battery or supercapacitor powered rolling stock to serve these routes. The use of diesel rolling stock on the East Coast Main Line and Fife Circle shall be banned by 2025. The use of diesel rolling stock on all of Scotland's rail routes shall be banned by 2030. The Plug Life Manifesto on Rail Travel aims to get cross-party support, since it is good for the economy, good for research, good for air quality, good for social mobility, and good for the environment. So there we go, all of Scotland's railway routes could be decarbonised today using off-the-shelf technology. And in terms of batteries versus fuel cells, it's more a case of batteries and fuel cells. It's horses for courses, fuel cells have a valid role to play for those longer and higher speed routes that batteries can't quite decarbonise on their own yet. But Give it a decade or so and battery chemistry will have caught up, in the case of the vast majority of those routes, to the point that they'll be more economical to run than fuel cell trains, I reckon. So that'll be an interesting development.
In other news, congratulations to the team at Fully Charged for a resoundingly successful Fully Charged Live, as always. So thank you very much for having us there. You put on a great show, each and every one of you. Um, also congratulations to the Fully Charged team for their new website that they've just launched. It really looks the part. I've also helped to launch that with a, an article on the history of electric vehicles. I've already had a few people say that they found it really interesting. Great to hear your feedback on that. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Also, the fully charged A to Z of everything is a brilliant resource for anyone looking for any information to do with EVs, renewables, energy storage, the lot. And I'm delighted to say that Plug Life Television makes an appearance on that directory. So thank you very much again to the fully charged team for that. Now I've got to sift through hundreds of gigabytes worth of video footage after coming back from the Isle of Skye and our road trip there in my 24 kilowatt hour short range Nissan Leaf. How did I get on? Stay tuned to find out. See you again soon for another episode of Plug Life Television.